having left behind their pastoral idol with the goat herders and sheep herders and all of that. Uh, Sancho and uh, Quixote are wandering along and again engaging in uh, a very funny but illuminating conversation. Illuminating for Sancho Panza who's starting to learn something about uh, what is expected of him and what this whole realm of uh, courtly behavior is all about and illuminating for us because when you get to see uh, Quixote talking with Sancho, you get what you didn't have in the first section of the book when Sancho, before Sancho appeared, which is a peek inside the thoughts of Quixote because he's trying to explain himself to, uh, to Sancho and Sancho is just matching this reality up against what he sees and it is inevitably a little bit of a gap between appearance and reality and that makes it sort of fun but uh, very soon they come across an inn they're tired it's been a long day and they're looking for some place to uh, spend the night and they come across an inn which is somewhat reminiscent of uh, the uh, the first sally where it's just a ramshackle place by the side of the road, but immediately Quixote sees it, and it is a castle. And, okay, fine. They go in, and they, uh, Cervantes, the author, uh, takes note that the, uh, the innkeeper and the establishment itself is very humble, but that the innkeeper's wife, unlike most such women, which is a little bit harsh, was naturally charitable and always sympathized with the misfortunes of those around her. Uh, so she welcomes them in and says, all right, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you for the night. Uh, and here you see again that sense of uh, the narrator, Cervantes, let's say, uh, or at least the Cervantes character that Cervantes is writing, is a little bit suspicious or a little bit of a snob, you know, uh, naturally charitable and always sympathize. Again and again, we're being shown these portraits of uh, ordinary people who are basically kind, who are basically decent, and who help. Uh, again, we go back to the, the first inn, and that's more or less what you found there. Uh, decent people who are just trying to get through life as best they can. They don't have a lot of money, uh, they don't have the luxury of great flights of fancy like, uh, like Quixote, but they're kind to one another. They're supportive. They feel a certain humanity. Uh, but here you have the, just that little note by the narrator who says, unlike most such women, such women, uh, indicates like, well, you know, those common folk, most of them are dirty and nasty. Uh, that's the way I read it personally. Maybe you have a different interpretation, but that's certainly the tone that seems to be setting. It's a little begrudging. That's saying, well, okay, this one's okay. She's one of the good ones, so to speak. Uh, which is a little off-putting, a little uh, objectifying. And that's kind of the purpose. Because, again, it makes you as a reader sit back and say, hmm, what, uh, what's going on here? So then as chapter 16 unfolds, we're getting a little tour of this inn. And the... Uh, uh, it's a fairly simple staff. There's the innkeeper, the innkeeper's wife. Uh, they have a daughter who's apparently quite lovely uh, and whom the 50-some-odd-year-old uh, um, Quixote immediately sees as quite, uh, quite pretty. And, of course, in his conjuring, this is the, the princess of the castle. Uh, the daughter of the great, uh, 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 of the lord of the manor, so to speak. And so he's off in his little imagination, and it's clear that he's taken a little bit of a shine to this girl. Uh, I'm using girl, this is probably accurate. Again, ages are a little questionable, but you get the sense that she is teenaged, perhaps, uh, maybe early 20s, but probably not much more than that. Uh, so, you know, make of it what you will. He, he's 50 and he's feeling a little, uh, a little itch. Uh, but, okay, fine. 
he's conjuring another little fantasy because when he's looking at her he is imagining that she is this great damsel this great princess and he is of course the illustrious lancelot like knight on the scene uh so he's getting diverted into that direction also on the staff is a uh is a housekeeper of sorts a uh uh, an, another woman from I forget which region, but you, we're introduced to a succession throughout this novel of people from very different regions. It's it's a very universalist approach where you're always encountering different people, uh, which is uh, part of the humanist dream almost. You know, always bringing in nothing human is alien to me. So all these very different people are bounded by their humanity. Okay. This woman comes in, and she is clearly um, somewhat uh, common. Uh, she is, for some reason, they characterize her uh, as very short. She's only like, uh, she is less than five feet tall. Uh, she is described as not especially attractive. She has some shady, questionable uh, background. Um, and uh, it is mentioned at a certain point that when uh when the lights go out she has a habit of accommodating uh one of the other guests or at least one of the other guests and you get the sense that it's not just the one guest uh she is a colorful character one of the many rogues you find in uh picaresque and uh certainly novels in general if poetry is the great uh genre for uh for the upper classes the novel generates itself as a portrait of the less upper classes let's say and so they are shown to quixote and sancho are shown to their room which is really just uh, essentially a garret or a uh, perhaps even a barn. It's a little uncertain uh, where they they can lie down and they're given a couple of uh, like basically on a pile of hay and uh, they have a couple of horse blankets, thin, uh, worn out horse blankets to spend their evening. But of course equipped with his imagination Quixote is seeing this as basically you know the Four Seasons Hotel in the same uh, hayloft or barn or whatever it is they have uh, they have a roomie uh, the aforementioned other guest who has this uh, nightly agreement with the uh, with the staff member and you know he's just sitting there and they all lights out uh, I don't think there are lights but at night it's time to go to sleep presumably the uh, the innkeeper and his wife and the family are asleep and <clears throat> of course Quixote is sitting there dreaming of uh, the young lady whom he saw earlier the the princess of the castle in walks the staff woman uh, who is there for her nightly assignation with the other guests and Quixote again it's very dark who can see anything he just reaches out and embraces this woman and he thinks that it is the princess when in fact it is definitely not the princess and he, uh, he there's this very lush uh, description of uh, of her that reads very much like uh, standard uh, Renaissance love poetry. Uh, her hair, though it was like more like uh, though it was more like a horse's mane to him, to him was strands of the most magnificent Arabian gold, so radiant that they darkened the sun itself. And though her breath surely smelled of garlic and stale salad, he thought her mouth gave off a delicate and gracious fragrance. And here, this is exactly the sort of stuff that uh, Shakespeare mocks in sonnet, what is it, 130, when, you know, uh, my, my, my love is uh, nothing like a rose or whatever. Uh, so he's saying that, you know, these, these images 
don't match up with reality, which is exactly what he encounters again and again and again. But he keeps at it, and it's this very lush description. And then he takes over the uh, the speech. Uh, and so, clasping her tightly, he began to speak in soft, amorous tones. Uh, and then he goes into this speech where he's declaring his lust, essentially, but that he could, of course, never, uh, never indulge that because he is uh, the declared worshiper of Dulcinea de Toboso. Uh, you know, would that I were able, oh, lovely and exalted lady. <laughs> to repay the immense favor that you have granted me by the light of your sight of your great beauty, blah, 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 blah. Saying, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't. But in the meantime, he's holding her and holding her rather tightly. And you get down to the next paragraphs and you just have deeply upset at finding herself clutched so tightly by Don Quixote. He is declaring again and again and again that he cannot, he cannot indulge in this because he is the betrothed of sorts to Dulcinea. But he is doing this while holding on to her and presumably trying to, you know, wrestle her into position, perhaps. Um, it's unclear exactly how much she is fighting here, um, but she is deeply upset at being clutched so tightly. It never says that, you know, he was holding her and then pushing her away. It says that he was clutching her so tightly throughout her, throughout his speech. So. He is letting his mind take this little walkabout into fantasy land while he is in the process of raping her, which is horrifying, but that's what's happening. He is, uh, his mind and his body are completely dissevered at this point, which is, of course, the mind is ideal in his case and the body is physical so once again you have this split between the ideal and the physical between the real world the, or the real world as it is and the imagined world as he would like it to be and he would like to be somebody who is very decorous and very gentlemanly and of course oh your your loveliness i will never touch you but at the same time he's basically dry humping her and uh, of course it ends with him and Sancho both getting the Jesus beat out of them because the other guy on the other end of the room who was expecting her to come groping towards him uh, comes over and the typical uh, mayhem ensues. But you get this, uh, this tight little scene of confusion of uh, the clash once again of his imagination and the reality as it is that he can't see. Now remember, this whole scene is playing out in the dark, so theoretically no one can see, including you know us. We don't know exactly what's going on while he's giving that speech. We assume an awful lot, but can we trust that? Can we trust our imagination just like he is trusting his. Where does that line fall? And these are the questions that are arising in this. And it's a troubling little passage. It is nothing, um, it's nothing to pass by it, just laughing. The laughter, I think, is very real because all of these little scenes, one after the other, are funny. They're great comic scenes. But there is an undercurrent of uh disturbance in them i mean we are talking about essentially a sexual assault here now certainly they're not having that that term there but there is an uncomfortable uh question of that should we just assume that this servant girl well she was asking for it so what does she really care well maybe she is just one of those such women or whatever as the, as the innkeeper's wife was first uh, discussed can we dismiss her humanity that way i don't know maybe the fact that she is short makes her somehow less than human maybe she is like a little troll who lives under the bridge so we don't need to care i don't know she makes a very brief appearance here it's just an uncertain relationship that the reader is supposed to have with her 
but still there's something uh, disturbing about this that uh, it gets passed over very quickly and it's very easy to just dismiss as just dismiss and say well you know that's just another comic scene and then you know if you dwell into it too much it's not funny anymore well yeah that's kind of the point if you sit there and start to think about things maybe they're not so funny anymore maybe they are tragic it's hard to escape that it's hard to escape just like he is just like Kihano is it's hard to escape that as much as he wants to imagine that he is this noble knight doing this noble thing by this noble lady. He is also a dirty old man who is sexually assaulting a much younger woman in this moment because his mind is one thing, but his physical urges are another. And he cannot leave them behind, no matter how much he's imagining he can. He's imagining that he's being very chaste and honor and honorable, but still the physical reality of lust can't be denied. It's part of humanity. Nothing human is alien to me. It's a small passage. It's a tiny little thing, but it means something.